Part of our discussion today is to better understand suicide and how it affects our youth. Today, we asked Brianne Moore to share her story about the depths of depression and despair and why we need to work together in finding solutions. Brianne has become an amazing advocate for the Royals Education Program, Is It Just Me? She speaks to thousands of students every year, encouraging them to seek help when they need it and have hope that recovery is possible. She is a recipient of the Royals Inspiration Award, a champion for youth, and a wonderful friend to the Royal. Please join me in welcoming Brianne. Hi everyone. I'm very excited to be here today speaking with you all. Uh, my name is Brianne and I am one in five Canadians living with a mental health disorder. I'm a daughter, sister, friend, volunteer, and mental health advocate. I love to dance and I go for runs daily. I prefer Starbucks over Tim Hortons and I watch a bit too much Grey's Anatomy. That is what makes me, me. I am also one in five Canadians living with a mental health disorder. I share my experiences with mental illness to end the stigma that surrounds mental health and so that I can help others who are going through similar things that I went through. There is no stigma if you need to go to the doctor for your physical health, but there is stigma if you need to go to the doctor for your mental health. Although one in five Canadians struggle with mental health, five in five of us have mental health. Or sorry, although um, one in five of us will struggle, five in five will have mental health. Why are we so afraid to talk about our brains? Stigma. If we keep talking about mental health, we can end the stigma that stops so many from getting the help they need. From a very young age, I began struggling with my mental health. I was three when I first began experiencing severe anxiety. And I remember being afraid of things that kids my age were not worried about. Things that kids my age would worry about were so much more intense for me. Things that were fun for other kids, I would miss out on because of my anxiety and I didn't go trick-or-treating for the first time until I was 10 years old. <coughs> From kindergarten through to the end of elementary school, my attendance at school was poor because of my anxiety. I was also bullied a lot, so on top of struggling with anxiety to begin with, being bullied made everything so much worse. My parents knew I had anxiety, and doctors did confirm it wasn't within a normal range, but nothing was done about it. No one understood the extent of what was going on, and I was too young to explain it. Every kid has fears, and there was hope that I would outgrow mine. Unfortunately, this was not the case. I was 13 when I started the eighth grade. I moved to a new school, which I loved. The bullying stopped, and I had a fantastic group of friends. My anxiety was under control, and things were going well. Although a few months into grade eight, I began to feel extremely depressed. This was new to me, and it was scary. I knew what anxiety was like, but I didn't know what it was like to feel so low, and I didn't know how to cope so I began self-harming. I kept my depression and self-harm a secret for quite some time, and I kept it a secret because I knew stigma existed. Stigma is frightening. I had never talked about mental health before, despite struggling with it from a very young age. I knew I wanted and needed help. I just wasn't sure how to get it. In grade nine, I had my first suicide attempt. I brushed it off because of fear and doubt. I feared that I would be judged, and I doubted that I would get the help I needed. Again, stigma holding me back and telling me not to speak up. It wasn't until I finally opened up and said I was struggling that I found out I actually had a pretty hefty history of mental illness within my own family. My biological grandfather on both sides of my family struggled with suicidality and both of them died by suicide. I thought I was an outsider and I had no clue that there were other people like me, let alone other people in my own family. Knowing what I know now, I would have reached out for help so much sooner. There is nothing wrong with needing help, and there is nothing wrong with asking for it. My struggle continued while I kept quiet. In grade 11, I was feeling physically sick in class and was having several panic attacks a day. One day, after receiving a bad mark on a test, I had a massive anxiety attack. I knew I couldn't go on like this anymore, so I texted my best friend and she met me at my locker. She walked me to my guidance counselor's office and she sat with me until I was okay. When the panic passed, I told my guidance counselor I was really struggling and wasn't doing well. She helped me set up counseling and helped me develop a plan to speak with my family doctor. My family was still struggling to understand what was going on, 
So my best friend, my guidance counselor, became major supports for me. My guidance counselor met with me regularly and provided me with a safe place where it was okay not to be okay. After reaching out and developing a support system, school became a safe haven for me. Grade 12 started. I was still in counseling, I was taking medication, and I felt ready for my final year of high school. But a month later, I felt that familiar feeling of hopelessness. This time, instead of waiting until I had reached my breaking point, I was honest with myself and those that supported me. So I spoke up. Depression wouldn't silence me this time. Depression made me feel like everything had to be black or white. I told others about this feeling and I felt supported. I continued attending high school as regularly as possible and filled my spare time with mental health advocacy. Dr. Louis, Dr. Louis. I was in a group called IMUM and we gave presentations on mental health to grade nine students within our school. In February of that year, I became homeless, which was difficult for me, but I also found out that I won the Royal Ottawa Youth Inspiration Award, which was presented to me in March. Getting involved with mental health advocacy gave my struggles a purpose. I turned something challenging and uncomfortable into something that can make a difference in my own community. I was so happy and so proud of myself. In April, I found stable housing and I also received my diagnosis. Generalized anxiety disorder, persistent depressive disorder, borderline personality disorder, and eating disorder not otherwise specified. It was difficult receiving my diagnosis, but it was also a relief. I finally knew what was going on and I could get the help that I needed. In June, I graduated, and even though I was in the hospital due to another suicide attempt the day of my graduation, I still walked across the stage and accepted my high school diploma. I made honor roll and I received a scholarship for my community, community involvement. These accomplishments remind me that you can do anything you set your mind to no matter what life throws at you. My major recovery moment came a few weeks later. It was summer and I was still in the hospital. I was coloring in the unit one night and I had just received some pretty disappointing news. My thoughts were racing and I couldn't get them to slow down. I stopped what I was doing, looked up and said to myself, Brianne, it's going to be okay. My thoughts are often like a highway, and it is very hard to recognize that a thought may not be true or unhelpful because they are all moving so quickly. This was the first time ever that I successfully challenged a distorted thought. There was no highway. From that moment on, I remember my whole thought process changing. Something clicked in my brain that day, and my brain finally stopped realizing it was all or nothing. After I left the hospital, I began an intensive treatment program and focused on working through the symptoms of borderline personality disorder. When I was first diagnosed, I had no clue what that meant. <laughs> Those diagnosed with borderline personality disorder often struggle with regulating their emotions, often resulting in impulsive behavior and trouble maintaining relationships. This is where a lot of that black and white thinking was coming from. I was in the program five months and I attended therapy four days a week. I was receiving a mix of occupational therapy, individual counseling, and dialectical behavioral therapy, which is a therapy for those specifically with BPD, to learn to regulate their emotions. I also saw a psychiatrist and took medication regularly. I learned that things did not have to be black and white. There was so much in between. I could have regulated emotions and live a fulfilling life. This was exactly what I needed and I began to feel like myself again. I realized that even though a part of me was always going to have these illnesses, that doesn't mean ill is all I was ever going to be. Recovery is not always easy, but it is worth it. It takes a lot of work to be able to challenge your thoughts and adapt the way you react to certain situations. Recovery is not linear. It is up and down and pretty much all over the place, and that's totally okay because that's life. I have bad days and I have good days, but now I have the skills to take care of myself on the days that feel impossible. Some of my favorite coping strategies are dancing, going for walks, and listening to music. Sometimes to cope, I will get stuff done that I've been putting off because it feels good to be productive, but other days it feels good to lay on the couch and binge watch Netflix. Recovery is not a decision you make once, it is a decision that you make every day. And recovery is a decision that I am making every day, and I am accomplishing things I never thought were possible. Like telling my personal journey with mental illness, working full time as a manager in retail, and being national chair on a coalition that fights for equitable access to depression medication. So, I am one in five Canadians that will struggle with a mental health disorder. <clears throat> you may have a member of your family who is the one in five, maybe a friend, a teacher, or maybe you yourself are the one in five. 
We've come a long way in ending the stigma surrounding mental health, but there is still so much work to be done. By being here today, we have already made a difference for the one in five. Today is World Suicide Prevention Day. We cannot let the conversations about struggling with suicidal thoughts stop today. Remember, it's okay not to be okay. And if you are struggling or know someone that is struggling, speak up. There is so much help available. Our voices are strong and powerful and people will listen to us. We are so much stronger than stigma. Thank you for listening. Brianne, you may be one in five, but you're one of a kind. <laughs> Thank you for your courage, your tenacity, and dedication. By sharing your story, you've inspired many, and you've helped to drive our suicide prevention forward. I think we can agree that having knowledge on suicide prevention is an important part of the puzzle, and acting on that knowledge is how we save lives. This is an area that Dr. Zachary Kaminsky understands well. He is exploring the paths that lead to suicide and is working to change the course. As a molecular biologist specializing in epigenetics, Dr. Kaminsky has had great success in generating new knowledge about suicide. After completing his graduate and postdoctoral training at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health through the University of Ottawa, he established an epigenetics lab at Johns Hopkins, Baltimore. There, in 2014, he identified a biomarker that indicates high suicide risk. That's amazing. In February of this year, Dr. Kaminsky joined our team at the Royal Institute of Mental Health Research as the DIFD Mark Ganslin Chair in Suicide Prevention Research. Here, he is building on his previous findings with an eye to a future at which simple blood tests might tell us who is, who is at highest risk for mental illness and allow us to intervene earlier and more effectively. <clears throat> he has also extended his work to explore social media, artificial intelligence, and the role they might play in suicide prevention. That is what he is going to share with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kaminsky. Well, thank you very much, Joanne. And thanks very much to the organizers in Suicide Prevention Ottawa for the invitation to come here today uh, representing the Royal Institute of Mental Health Research affiliated with the University of Ottawa. Today, I'm excited to be here talking about our work on AI on the front lines of suicide prevention. I wanna keep in mind, I wanna put this in context as I get started that today is going to be a discussion. This, these are early days and we're developing new techniques that we envision could be generated into tools. But today is really about getting the perspective of the community of people who are affected by suicide and frontline suicide prevention experts to try to understand how we can work together to build a tool uh, that will actually be useful. Very good, okay, is that a little bit better? All right. Okay, very good. So. I want to get started and remind everyone that suicide is complex. While we know that uh, mental health can be a, a, a major risk factor for uh, suicide attempts, there are multiple complex paths. Um, anxiety, uh, alcohol and illicit drug use, as well as stressors can be major factors in uh, increasing suicide risk. Of course, suicide is a major public health problem. Just a few statistics. Uh, I believe the official number is 11.5 people out of 100,000 uh, in Canada uh, is the suicide rate. But importantly, and it's been mentioned, the suicide rates have been stable for 60 years, but in the last uh, Statistics Canada uh, numbers, they're actually on the rise. So hopefully that doesn't uh, continue to go up. Uh, some years, there are more deaths by suicide than motor vehicle accidents. And there are ultimately 11 suicides a day in Canada. It's also the second leading cause of death for 15 to 34 year olds in Canada. Those numbers are very similar in the United States. I believe it's the second leading cause for uh, 10 to 24 year olds in the United States. 
And so uh, the National Action Alliance, which is a, a group of international suicide experts, has suggested a number of priorities for research in this area. They've suggested uh, one priority relevant to us is to identify and target those subgroups that are at the greatest risk. And this is because suicide is preventable if we know who is at risk. One of the things that complicates suicide research is that there are different phenotypes. So uh, the rates of suicide ideation versus suicide attempt and then death by suicide are not the same. They're not always the same thing. So it's a challenge when studying uh, suicide ideation to, to understand uh, if this is going to lead to more severe suicide behavior. But there will be instances in which uh, there is a progression from suicide ideation to attempt. And a number of large epidemiological studies, uh, this one done in over 22 countries, which, which with over 200,000 people, has shown that uh, only a few factors seem to precipitate increased risk. They found a statistical interaction with stressors and anxiety, suggesting that maybe our stress system was important. A lot of other evidence in the field suggests that uh, the stress diathesis model is an important model for suicide risk. This is where we have some sort of vulnerability to stress, which may be conferred by our biology, meets a state of stress. So uh, something happens, a major life stressor, to promote risk. And so our hope, uh, and what I'll talk about today, is using AI methods uh, to try to understand the state of stress better. But I will, just to put things in perspective, speak briefly about the biology, just to put things in context. So uh, we study in the laboratory a field called epigenetics, which holds the promise to identify environmental effects directly on our DNA. This is because a number of factors that can promote risk to psychiatric illnesses like uh, maternal stress when pregnant or maternal diet effects or uh, postnatal effects, adverse childhood experiences, being abused when you're a baby or even neglected can actually leave a mark on our DNA that we can then measure. And this has reference to that, that blood test we were uh, mentioning before. These marks are called epigenetic marks. And when they're there, they can actually act like a light switch to turn a gene off. They compact DNA and transcription factors can't gain access. But without that DNA methylation, without that epigenetic mark, we can get significant gene expression. The cells do what they're supposed to do. The genes do what they're supposed to do. So a number of years ago, we looked in uh, post-mortem tissue in suicide decedents uh, and controls, and we asked what light switches are turned off when they should be on, and what is on when it should be off. And we looked across the entire genome using novel technologies, and we found a biomarker in one gene which appeared to be able to predict risk to suicide. This gene was related to the stress system, and it pe appeared to be important for uh, potentially modulating and regulating the stress system. And when we looked at it in blood, it appeared to be predictive of suicide attempt. So here I'm showing you what are called rock curves, receiver operator characteristic curves. They really show you uh, the sensitivity and specificity. This one over here is showing you that we're about 70% predictive of suicide attempt in this cohort. But really, uh, these lines will sort of orient you. The sensitivity means we're catching almost 80% of cases. And the specificity is not quite as good for this marker. It shows that we're uh, missing. These are the false positives. So we're identifying about 35% of cases as potentially uh, suicide attempt cases who are not. Right? So clearly, this needs improvement. And this could be because the biological element uh, really just gives us a piece of the puzzle. So the biology may tell us who's resilient in times of stress and conversely who is vulnerable in times of stress. But this is also limiting in a way because we're sort of limited to uh, instances where we may be able to get a blood sample, right? We need to consider how fast can we get this data and is that useful enough in the context? Also, uh, under what situation, since we think this interacts with stress, are we going to be able to do this? Uh, we could think about this in the emergency room context or potentially in military applications where we, we know that people may be going off to uh, deployment in stressful situations. In any case, it's clear that we need novel methods to try to understand stress in real time. And this is why we're starting to try to develop mobile technologies uh, interfacing with social media. OK, so taking the biology out of the puzzle, now we're talking about this state of stress in the stress diathesis model. OK, so now I'd like to spend a little bit of time just talking about artificial intelligence, because I think it's important to orient us. I don't know if you noticed, but artificial intelligence is here. So uh, here I'm just showing a, a, a husband and wife here are having a conversation over breakfast um, about how old uh, the husband's car is getting. And I don't know if you notice on the left hand of the slide, but there's a device there. Um, and it may be listening, and it may not. And then uh, perhaps later, um, 
perhaps uh, innocuously, uh, a gentleman is uh, on the computer and up pops an ad, which he may or may not notice, but it's for the new Honda Civic. Uh, and uh, this may or may not impact uh, his consciousness, but it's there. And I don't know if you've been paying attention over the, the last number of years I have, and the content of these sorts of ads on our internet browsers have become more and more specific. So the internet is using artificial intelligence to sell us cars. Can we use it to do something good? All right. So artificial intelligence, what, is it, what do we mean? Well, let's first talk about what we don't mean, OK? We don't mean creating some sort of self-aware entity that lives in the computer and is there to solve our problems. What is artificial intelligence, OK? So artificial intelligence is a broad concept that machines should be able to carry out tasks that humans consider to be smart. Okay, And often this is used interchangeably with machine learning. Now machine learning uh, is an application of AI with the assumption that we should be able to give machines a lot of data and let them figure out things for themselves. Okay, So a few important points about machine learning. Machine learning is a tool that lets us model outputs of interest based on large sets of training data. So machine learning can find some unseen relationships to aid in the prediction of outputs, like suicide ideation suicide ideation versus non-suicide ideation, those outputs that we're interested in. But the relationships within the data that generate the predictive accuracy are not always apparent. As such, machine learning programs are often referred to as black boxes. I like to, to think of the analogy that uh, machine learning is a lot like panning for gold. So here we have someone uh, panning for gold. And uh, effectively with this analogy, the gold is the useful information, and uh, everything else is the dirt. But we're looking for the useful information. Okay, So we'll have a set of training data, which will be uh, everything, useful information and non-useful information. This goes into the black box, the machine learning algorithm. And we train this on uh, what we know to be case or control output. And then later, it's going to be able to predict the status as well. Okay, So one useful black box method is called the neural network. So the neural networks were actually developed a long time ago, back in the uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, Rosenblatt, I believe, was the first to do this. And what was interesting was that the, he was modeling this on Hebb's rule in neuroscience. Okay, He was modeling it. I'm going to read this just uh, because I think it makes things clear. When axon of cell A is near enough to excite cell B repeatedly or persistently, uh, it takes part in firing it. Some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both cells such that A's efficiency as one of the cells firing B is increased. So what he's saying is that cells are getting stronger the more they're used. They're effectively learning. Okay. So um, while we have here a neuron where uh, there's some sort of input connections that allow an output, uh, in machine learning this is called a uh, perceptron. And so uh, effectively we have these layers or connections of perceptrons uh, that can actually stimulate their subsequent perceptrons uh, to fire. I, I don't know if you noticed, but one lightning bolt is larger than the other, and this has relevance to uh, the learning. So in this way, the networks of perceptrons are designed to learn through repeated observations. And this is called training a model. Like our own neurons, perceptrons can make stronger or weaker connections in order to learn relationships. Adding layers of perceptrons can actually handle some complicated tasks. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that what we're really doing here is making computers do what we as humans can do already. We're, that's what artificial intelligence is. That's the intelligence part. For example, uh, we can answer the question, what is a bicycle? Okay. So um, if we ask the computer to do this in a simple way, well, if we just try to overlay the pixels, they're not going to actually line up. Okay. Uh, they would line up kind of randomly, and we can't do this. Furthermore, the um, computer might not be able to see what is a, a motorcycle versus a bicycle. But here on these bikes, there are some similar elements. Right? We've got handlebars. We've got uh, pedals, right? And so what we do is we actually create layers, like in our brain, of these perceptrons. And these layers accomplish things like combining these various inputs and then mapping them on to the outputs. In this way, we're able to identify what's a bicycle and not a motorcycle using the computer. So sometimes uh, determining the elements to look for to define something is not quite as straightforward as that. Um, more complicated in problems might, for example, be the doppelganger problem. So here I have uh, a picture. On the left is the drummer for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Chad Smith. And on the right is uh, comedic actor uh, Will Ferrell, this uh, example taken with permission from uh, Adam Gady. And so uh, effectively, these guys look pretty similar. But if you look closely, you can probably tell them apart. But this could be a challenge for a machine. OK. Um, what we're going to do is ask the machine to tell them apart, but in its own way. Okay. Uh, 
So, uh, for example, a human way that's been tried to do this is to effectively look for measurements from the nose to cheek and nose to eye and try to come up with a way to tell faces apart. But this actually doesn't work. Okay. Um, here, uh, in this clip from, I think it's CSI, they're going to find uh, that there's no match. It's not working. Okay. However, we can uh, instead take all of these pixels and digitize them into digital information and feed these into neural networks. And so I believe uh, OpenFaceGL took tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of faces and effectively did this in a, a much larger neural network than this, but really saying, okay, computer, you find out how to tell faces apart. You figure it out. Um, and so what they came up with was 128 measurements. Okay, so here are the 128 measurements that define Will Ferrell's face. But importantly, this is a black box. This is critical. Nobody knows what these numbers correspond to, right? No one knows where on the face these are, but they work. So here's a, a, a clip that uh, Adam Gaiety created with his uh, artificial intelligence frame by frame identifying correctly, despite whether they're looking sideways or head on, who's Will Ferrell and who is Chad Smith, as well as uh, who Jimmy Fallon is, right? So clearly this technology is uh, uh, quite advanced. Okay, so these neural networks, uh, they can do a lot of quite useful things. They can uh, perform image recognition, which I've clearly outlined here, but they can also be used for uh, creating chatbots, for example. Um, if you just feed in conversations, you can converse with a machine and they learn. Uh, if that conversation is specific to something like uh, fixing your TV, you can get these technical support chats, which may or may not be with a computer. Um, this is also really uh, a breakthrough in language translation, as well as other forms of natural language processing, which gets us into what we're doing. So now I'd like to switch gears and talk about the application of AI to mental health and what we're doing here. Uh, I like to joke that I think we've now entered the spell check generation's use of uh, biostatistical packages. If you're in research, a lot of uh, machine learning scripts can be uh, downloaded and, and easily applied. So I encourage you to, to try them out to see what they can do because uh, they're quite interesting. Um, a lot of the subsequent work we've uh, written ourselves in Python. Um, and uh, okay, and this has been done really to focus on the idea of social media. So we're on our phones all the time, we're on our computers, and social media is here to stay. People are putting information out there at a very fast rate. Okay, And so the idea is, can we turn social media data into numbers that we can feed into these black boxes? Okay, We decided to start our research with Twitter. And this is because, um, well, I'll, I'll explain why in a moment. But I'd first like to point out, uh, look at the, at the top uh, the bar to the left there. The highest penetration rate, and these numbers are from 2015, is in uh, individuals 18 to 34. And you remember I mentioned that suicide is the second leading cause of death in individuals uh, 15 to 35. So it seems like a logical place to start there. Another reason that makes Twitter uh, logical is that uh, Twitter data is public. It's 100% public and users are advised of this. Uh, it's even in the privacy statement that uh, users should be advised that their data is likely to be downloaded and analyzed by public health agencies. I'd also like to point out that finding people with suicidal ideation on Twitter is not hard. Uh, if you just go online and you uh, put in suicide thinking, uh, Twitter will give you all of the keywords that involve suicide. So uh, for example, here's someone who is tweeting about um, a suicide prevention hotline. There's another person who's tweeting about uh, thinking about starting a YouTube channel where they discuss topics like anxiety, depression, suicide, child abuse. You know, should I do it? Yes or no. And then there's others that are clearly uh, suicide ideation. And so uh, there has been work in this field already, which is attempting to apply machine learning to identify these sorts of suicidal tweets. So this is a, a recent paper that's effectively uh, using convolutional neural networks, like the neural networks I mentioned, to identify what is a suicide tweet uh, versus not. So this one is identifying um, I'm in pain and suicidal as a suicide tweet. And that's very useful. I think that's important. But this is really focusing on identifying those specific tweets. We want to try to move past this to identify maybe what's a pattern upstream of these tweets. I'd also like to point out before I get to that, though, that if you pay Twitter slightly uh, a little bit more, you can get more information, such as the age, uh, the sex, and the geolocation uh, of individuals. Uh, we don't have this access yet. but 
um, this uh, sort of data can give you uh, various capabilities. So here's uh, an application I found online called TalkWalker that effectively is, uh, there in their example, a tweet has gone out, something about Wimbledon, and then you can instantly see where all of the other tweets that are retweeted or related to this tweet are coming from. So uh, you can do this for a particular postal code uh, or, or larger areas, for example. And so um, I believe that uh, there are companies that are doing this, such as Advanced Symbolics, which has a contract with the federal government to try to do this to um, identify suicide risk as well. Uh, you could think about using this to uh, test the effects of, of suicide contagion as well. Um, this could also allow for the evaluation of suicide awareness or prevention efforts, right? So th the important thing about this data is we're not limited to just real time. What if we looked in the past and said, well, what was the, uh, uh, the suicide activity before I did an intervention in the community um, versus afterwards? I think that this could be uh, potentially quite useful. But importantly, uh, these do not address individual level risk. OK, so um, now I'd like to talk about using AI to generate uh, psychological constructs from what people are tweeting. Really effectively trying to turn a tweet into a number. So this was our uh, work here. This is uh, our method that we're trying to develop. And effectively we're modeling this work on some psychological theories for suicide. Uh, the first was Thomas Joyner's uh, interpersonal psychological theory of suicide, which suggests that risk to suicide uh, develops from a feeling of uh, perceived burdensomeness or thwarted belongingness. Right? And this uh, meets with the capability to promote risk. But there's other uh, useful theories, including the hopelessness model, which suggests that there's some sort of negative cognitive style with this. Uh, it's sort of like potentially a pessimism, uh, potentially inability to deal with uh, uh, stress or negativity. And then a stressful or negative event occurs, and this promotes risk. If you think about it, it's not too different from the stress diathesis model from just a uh, psychological perspective. Perhaps there's some sort of biological vulnerability that's conferring uh, whatever that negative cognitive style is. In any case, Kleinman and colleagues have suggested that integration of these techniques may have merit, um, as well as uh, risk factors such as uh, depression and anxiety and insomnia. We wanted to model these things. So here was our approach. We effectively took Twitter data and we put in a query for something like burden. And we filtered this on a negative affect using sentiment analysis. We also filtered this on high subjectivity. So someone has to be tweeting about I, myself, and not necessarily about uh, Donald Trump or uh, Brazil or something like that. And then we compared this uh, in a control group to other queries like life is good or I like cats or football um, with a positive filter. And then we came up with thousands upon thousands of tweets, which were then fed into our neural networks. Effectively, at the end of this, we get a score between zero and one for how burdened uh, or how burdened uh, some is a given tweet. Okay, and again, we did this for a number of constructs, including loneliness, stress, hopelessness, depression, anxiety, insomnia, uh, etc. Okay, so the first uh, thing we wanted to do was evaluate. Well, well, how well did these things work? This was uh, one way to try to do this was to um, use a number of uh, established scales. We basically binarily coded these. This is an example of the UCLA loneliness scale. Um, for example, uh, a statement like, I feel in tune with the people around me. That is not a lonely statement, so that gets a zero. Um, I lack companionship uh, is a lonely statement, so it gets a one. This allows us to statistically see how we're doing. And importantly, you'll notice that not all of these um, statements involve the word lonely. And so um, across the board, our models uh, perform uh, fairly well to identify uh, correctly the statements that are used in these scales, uh, sort of between 70 to 80% uh, accuracy using those uh, uh, rock curves to, uh, to chart our accuracy. But importantly, emulating psychological scales is not the only thing we're after. We want to catch all of this and more. Okay, So I want to point out that uh, I'm going to show some, some tweets that we catch with our models now. And you can get this within uh, probably less than five minutes, uh, depending on the speed of the computer. Mine's quite slow um, in my office. But um, out of uh, potentially six months to even up to two years worth of data in less than five minutes, you can see what are the top depression statements. So um, I'm going to read a few of these. Uh, these are high scoring depression model scores. I'm so fat it's, it's almost depressing to think about. I'm so stressed out and depressed uh, about my weight. Um, let's see. Uh, last year I was miserable and depressed. Um, okay. Here's some for the for the lonely model. Uh, this person is on the bus alone and they want to cry. Um, 
let's see, they hate family dinners. It's so unimportant. Uh, I literally mean nothing to anyone anymore. I swear I can die, um, et cetera. I'm just uh, too suicidal to tell the truth. Not actively suicidal because else I wouldn't be tweeting this. Uh, the stress model catches, uh, I'm so stressed out and depressed about my weight. Again, this whole thing actually made me frustrated and, and low-key stressed. And then the burden model um, here, the last one I'll read. Um, I'm so irritable about uh, a person. Uh, I'm so desperate and in deep despair. I'm feeling so hopeless. I hate feeling like this, uh, et cetera. So um, as I point these out, uh, I want to keep in mind that things can be tailored to the way that would be acceptable to uh, individuals who might uh, be interested in this in a practice. So for example, if people don't want you uh, reading tweets, um, but would be available to, to have something like a profile picture with time that would allow you to ask, well, what happened um, 200 days ago, for example? Or what happened last week? I'm, again, I'm going to show a couple examples um, of what these peaks look like over time. But you could look at uh, a month or whatever period of time. And uh, this person here is saying that uh, they had a, an anxiety attack and they've been feeling sad at work lately, a lot lately. It's getting harder not to feel like I only matter as an afterthought anymore. So again, the important point is that these are being picked up very quickly, we don't necessarily have time uh, to go through and read uh, all of someone's public social media. But if you wanted to see what might be important from that uh, immediately, then you could use something like this. OK. So again, we're using these neural networks. Here's another example of a profile. This was sort of a beta version of an app we were trying to generate. Um, uh, We've put this on hold. It's not uh, out there yet. But it just, again, shows what some of these pictures or profiles look like. On the left side of the, uh, the profiles are a few red lines uh, going vertically. And these were lines where people were tweeting about thinking about suicide. And um, on the uh, x-axis, you, uh, you can see that, OK, they had sort of a, a high stress score and a high lonely score in about a month uh, before this suicide ideation. So uh, perhaps this gives us some insight into uh, what, might, what might have been preceding uh, this suicidal ideation. Um, with that being said, there's a lot of data. And looking at these profiles may or may not always be uh, useful. So what we might want to do is try to boil this down into something that um, is effectively uh, more synthesized. And to do that, we're going to try to use more machine learning. So now I'm going to introduce another uh, type of machine learning called random forest classifiers. Um, so random forests are really just combinations of decision trees. Well, what is a decision tree? Well, actually, we use decision trees all the time in our everyday thought processes. Uh, we probably use them today. Um, for example, when I woke up and I thought, what will the weather be like today? So uh, usually, uh, if I formalize this, we might start with, well, what season is it? And this will give us a particular range of temperatures. And then I might think, well, it, you know, what is the precipitation out there? And given uh, whether it's winter or summer, I make it other ranges. And then uh, on down the line, am I in BC? Am I in Ottawa, et cetera? Um, until at some point, we've got enough uh, elements in our decision tree to, to sort of come up with a good guess. Well, random forests are really just a group of decision trees trained on randomly selected subsets of data, where the output of the decision trees is average. In other words, it's like asking 500 people what they think the weather will be like today and then averaging it. It's actually going to be more accurate than just asking one person. Okay, so that's effectively what the method is. So we wanted to use a random forest to integrate our neural network-derived tweet scores and assess for the ability to segregate suicidal ideators uh, from controls. OK, so uh, here, uh, from this example I'm showing you before, um, we had a number of instances of suicidal ideation, as well um, as instances where people are, are not talking about suicide at all. But we also included a large number in our control group of people who are tweeting about suicide, but not in the context of suicide ideation. For example, this person that's thinking about uh, starting a YouTube channel to discuss uh, mental health. And so uh, this is our training set. It's a heat map. It just shows you we've turned all of those uh, uh, metrics into uh, colors here to show you uh, the data in the training set uh, for burden, loneliness, uh, stress, depression, anxiety, uh, insomnia, hopelessness, as well as uh, the hour. Are we tweeting at midnight? Are we tweeting at noon? Uh, and the month. Are we tweeting in December or are we tweeting um, in the summer? And we created this uh, data set in about uh, 254,000 tweets from the cases and 400,000 tweets from the controls. And uh, so now that we look at this as a picture, I mean, I think we can see the pattern, right? No, 
I can't see it. It's, it's very complicated, but we're going to ask the computer to find the pattern, right? One other way to think about random forests that I, I've always thought about random forests this way is it's like Plinko from The Price is Right. Um, so I grew up watching Bob Barker's Price is Right, so I made sure to find a Bob Barker Plinko picture. But um, I'm going to turn this data on the side, and uh, effectively what we have is an in individual's data, and then based on what their metrics are for all of these um, values, they're going to go through the model and wind up on one side or the other for case control. Okay, so um, effectively, we wanted to ask the question in a different way. We wanted to say, you know, can we find risk of suicidal ideation before the ideation occurs? So we actually stratified everything on time, and we only took data from at least a week upstream because we wanted to ask, you know, you know, we wanted to give it some time that if you identify risk. Um, would there be time to, to have conversations and to act and to get help? Um, so we're using about two weeks worth of data, putting this into the model. Okay, uh, this was our test set. We had 72 uh, suicide ideation cases and 160 controls. Um, again, with the same metrics, but now uh, we're pretending we don't know the status, and we're saying, well, how well does the model do? And uh, so this data, you know, we it's it's preliminary, but it's working quite well. Uh, we're getting an accuracy of about 89% um, and a sensitivity of about 90% uh, and a specificity of about 80%. So this means that we're catching about 90% of uh, suicide ideation cases and uh, we're getting about 20% 20 20 false positives. So having a clinical tool in predictive accuracy is also based on what the population rates of a given phenotype are. So with suicide ideation, understanding it may be 4% of the population, this would mean that, uh, in theory, if these numbers bear out with more research, um, if you had a negative test, it would suggest that you're not at risk. If you had a positive test, you would have a 1 in 8 chance of, of being uh, at risk. So uh, this is potentially clinically actionable, um, or uh, definitely worth having a conversation about. Now, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, or sometimes a thousand tweets is worth creating a picture. So um, what we did was actually take that interrogated time frame box and slide it over time, and then just plot uh, what this looked like. And we get some interesting pictures when we do this. And I'm pointing this out just to show you potential other capabilities that we could generate. Um, so I don't know if you guys see a pattern here um, or not. It looks maybe a little sinusoidal. Let me add some information to this. This is the end of January, and this is uh, the beginning of May. So if we're looking at this, we might think um, seasonal affective disorder. And in fact, uh, this data uh, was uh, given to me by someone with uh, seasonal affective disorder. Um, I didn't know that ahead of time, but importantly, I ran it. Um, and in about five minutes, I texted them. I said, is this the case? They said, uh, that's quite interesting, yes. Um, here's another pattern. Um, we actually see this pattern quite a bit um, in a number of people. I mentioned that I don't have uh, sex information on this, but um, we can see sort of, a, again, a bit of a fluctuating pattern that seems to go with month here. Um, and uh, it might be interesting to look uh, to see if this is related potentially to premenstrual dysphoric disorder or um, sort of hormonal fluctuation induced uh, depression. Um, I think that. Uh, you know, one capability of this is that if someone comes into your office with a depression, you may be able to say, well, you know, what might this be related to? Um, and that may, um, again, potentially uh, help uh, think about types of treatment or management plans. Uh, okay. So um, now uh, I want to point out that the uh, day of suicide ideation tweeting here is at the zero. It's now on the left hand of the screen. And I've just segregated the people with suicide ideation and the controls and looked for uh, any relationship. And we do see statistically significant relationships here, looking at three months of data and one month of data that shows a correlation. What this is saying is that if we perform on average a profile over time, the risk is getting higher as we get closer to thinking about suicide ideation. So that could be potentially useful. You can also see that, of course, the groups are different, and that helps us with our predictive accuracy. Um, this is just a zoom in of that. Now, importantly, I've been talking about suicidal ideation, suicidal thinking, but uh, this isn't the end all be all of what we want to try to model. So um, there will be instances of suicidal ideation that don't progress to more severe suicidal behavior. But we really want to try to intervene in individuals um, where, uh, who might be at higher risk. Of, uh, of suicidal thought um, that progressed to suicide attempt. 
Okay. And so really um, what we did was basically to query the Twitter feeds of the suicide ideation cases for any past admission of history of suicide attempt. Um, and we asked what do the profiles of past suicide attempters look like? Uh, here's the plot. And you can, I think, pretty clearly see that there's a tiered relationship here such that um, our model where it is today, it has controls with the lowest risk, uh, suicidal ideators who are not attempters, um, sort of above them, distinguishable, but at lower risk, and then the suicide attempters are showing um, uh, the highest correlation as they get more severe, as they get closer to suicide uh, ideation. Um, and here's just a zoom in of that as well for three months and one month of data. Okay. And of course, uh, we're also uh, attempted, uh, now these are relatively smaller sample sizes, um, but we tried to just generate uh, a random forest to try to predict um, suicide attempters amongst uh, suicide ideators. And uh, again, this is very preliminary, but uh, we want to do more research, but we're encouraged by how promising uh, this is. It, it appears that um, this is giving us a 91% uh, accurate score. And again, um, this would suggest that a negative test might indicate uh, that someone might not be at risk. And uh, given the lower population uh, rate of suicide attempts, um, this would suggest that uh, a positive score would be about a 1 in 38 chance of, uh, of suicide attempt. Um, so again, it's important to keep this in mind and think about how we can make these better. Uh, potentially, we could think about pairing these uh, sorts of um, scores with biological information as well to, to round out the whole picture. But this is where we stand uh, today. I'd like to end by showing um, this sobering profile. Uh, this is uh, a plot from a, uh, uh, a suicide that was in the public eye. Uh, and so we downloaded the data. Uh, you can see that for about four years worth of data, uh, this person has sort of a, a score that would indicate suicide ideation. But here at the end, uh, there's a drastic uptick. And if I zoom in, uh, again, you can, you can see that I, I think that um, this really makes the point that uh, this model potentially would have uh, suggested that about 30 days or 25 days out, uh, there might have been a, a big indication of risk. So again, you know, this is one example. But I think this is where we want to get to. This is uh, you know, something that we could program in uh, potentially to, to set off uh, flags or to uh, talk with a, a family member to potentially have a, a conversation or, or whoever we decide to put this technology in the hands of, if anybody. So in summary, AI methods allow us to find stressful life events within seconds that may have relevance to a person's mental well-being. Using machine learning, we can convert text data to numerical data to enable statistics. And AI methods can untangle relationships in large amounts of data and classify groups with a high degree of accuracy. I'd like to make this point, uh, and that is that critically, these methods are black boxes, which means that just going back and reading someone's Twitter isn't going to tell you necessarily if they have suicide risk. What it means is that um, there's an unseen relationship. Just like those 128 face measurements, we don't know uh, what is the relationship that is promoting risk. It may be that they tweeted something happy at midnight and something lonely at 7 a.m. and then something positive at 8 a.m. We just don't know. Um, and we can't know because of the nature of these algorithms. But we can use this to create a tool and try to make the tool better and better to try to come up with uh, good suicide prevention strategies. And so I'd like to finish by just sort of bringing up a few discussion points um, to have uh, uh, feedback on. And that is, who should have access to this technology? Once this gets up and running, um, I've shown you what we think that we're capable of doing. Uh, but these are early days, right? Um, I don't want to build a use, useless tool. I want to build something that uh, the community might use, something that may prevent suicides. And so who should have access to this technology? Should it be parents? Um, should it be in the hands of gatekeepers who are used to handling private information? What's the potential for abuse, uh, either by stigmatization or potentially uh, being used by uh, insurance companies or employers to um, uh, come up with reasons to exclude people, for example? What if a bully gets a hold of this? And what are some protections that we can put in place uh, to make sure that it's doing good and not harm? Um, could this be used to triage people who are uh, awaiting mental health services to find out who might be at uh, in most urgent need of uh, available resources. Um, I think with that, I'd like to just uh, stop and thank uh, my volunteer who worked with me this summer and did a lot of work in helping to generate the um, 
neural networks for psychological constructs, Rachel McGinn, as well as funding from DIFD and the Matt Gainsland Foundation, and of course the Royals Institute of Mental Health Research affiliated with the University of Ottawa. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Zach. Well, that's really inspiring. And uh, what if uh, Alexa could uh, help you in a way that was very meaningful? Um, we've put the questions back up because this is the portion of the agenda today where we invite some discussion. And um, I'm going to invite Ben and Vicky and Zach to have a seat. And I'll join you moment. Actually, I'll moderate from here um, to invite some questions and thoughts from those of you in the audience who've uh, who've seen this now. And uh, I'll open it up to the OTN folks as well. Uh, we've got Brockville, Kingston, Arm Prior, and Carlingwood. And I'm hoping that uh, Martin could sig signal me if uh, anybody on OTN has a question. Not everybody at once, just... Yes, Caitlin. It's throwable mic. Now it might be too loud. Um, so originally you were speaking about these two people talking about needing a new car, and eventually there was advertisements online that were signaling car advertisements for these people. So is there the idea behind you know, using social media tweets and, and Facebook to identify those who might be at higher risk and then maybe putting up advertisements for crisis resources and, and, and maybe that's a way of going about that? Absolutely. I mean, I think that that is uh, uh, a great frontline thing to do and something that we can uh, absolutely do. And in fact, uh, Facebook is doing this uh, already. So they have an algorithm that uh, is designed to try to, I believe it's using keywords looking for suicide to try to push uh, prevention materials, which um, I think is really one of the advantages of using the internet is that um, it also allows people to stay anonymous. And maybe that's where everything stops. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, that's a great point And thank you for bringing it up. Great question. There's a gentleman here. Here? Oh, here. I'll, I'll throw you the mic. Oh. <laughs> yeah, my name's uh, Mickey. I volunteer here at the Royal. Uh, for me, it's the whole privacy idea. Um, that's probably what might uh, stop all this stuff. Like, I think most people wouldn't think that Twitter is collecting that kind of stuff because we never read the stuff. And same with Facebook. You start being a little more cautious, and then you start going to things like. Uh, uh, WhatsApp, where everything's encrypted and things. So I think you'd need some legal stuff kind of set right away if you're going to eat by the government, per se, like Canadians are much different than some other countries. And I think that would maybe be something you'd want to look at uh, for sure. Because uh, if I was going to commit suicide, I'd stay off Facebook <laughs> kind of thing. I wouldn't, you know, like it's, if you knew that, so you want to be doing it under the shelf, but that's not the way the world works today. So, Right. Well, I mean, I think, so that's a great point. And the point is, is privacy. And this is something that we can think about uh, coding in, uh, keeping everyone's information private. It could be password uh, protected in a way, or it could be behind the sort of uh, clinician-patient uh, privacy relationship. Um, but, you know, someone could consent to use this tool on their data if they wanted uh, uh, a therapist um, to have uh, sort of more insight into what was happening uh, over the time that they weren't there. Um, I think one of the things I try to show you is that we're not necessarily just uh, uh, coming up with a suicide risk yes, no question, but some of the other possible capabilities of running this model could be to come up with insights for what sort of depression uh, may be going on in the background. And this could potentially be of interest to someone of why they would sign up for this um, to understand, well, maybe it's uh, uh, seasonal affective disorder. Um, maybe it's, uh, it's fluctuating. Um, or to understand, oh, well, you know, what seems to be, kicking, what are my stressful life events? Well, you can see and plot them out where and when this happened. I know that there's, um, my hope for, for this is that there are um, uh, people that sign up for things like uh, uh, Mood 24-7, where people are texted their uh, uh, a scale 
daily and they input their mood metrics on purpose because they want to see a plot of how they're doing. How am I doing? Um, and I think one of the interesting things about this is that we can sort of do it on ourselves and see how we're doing without necessarily realizing what's driving the model. Okay. Thanks. I, I just wanted to add something as well. At the end, you said um, someone who is suicidal might stay off of the platform because of it. And what we found from working with people uh, with suicide ideation and people with lived experience is actually quite the opposite, um, is that uh, people who are thinking about suicide, they don't want to die. They want the pain to stop. And we see that when help is made available in a, in a compassionate way where, where they feel like they're being listened to, those people often do reach out and do get help. And so if we can do it in a compassionate way, if we can do it in a way um, that isn't uh, looked at as mischievous or uh, you know malicious in any way that we're really there for the right reasons that I think a lot of people would come forward and you know I'm thinking about uh, our friends from distress center in the back and you can think about how many people call distress center lines every day and those are people who are seeking out help so if we could do it on these social platforms in a way that's shown that we're there uh, for the right reasons uh, I think that could be a really good tool for good an excellent point other thoughts yes David. So, so thanks. I was struck by the uh, con the the idea that um, from a maybe from a public health perspective, there's a way of you potentially you have a way of measuring the impact of interventions uh, because it seems to me that it's it's hard to measure that something didn't happen, and which is of course what we want to do with with this very important subject. But the idea that you could say I think I can. I can bend the curve somehow, but with this particular intervention and then seeing it happen over a period of months or years, um, I think would be a very powerful thing and, and particularly when we're appealing to funders for, for money to, to, to uh, impact or, or to be able to, to design and, and implement some of these interventions. So I think it's really encouraging from that perspective. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think that it's definitely one of the very interesting uh, facets and capabilities of this. Can we look in an area that received an intervention or not? Of course, understanding that it's the internet and the effects may be far reaching, but uh, I think it's something that will uh, allow potentially to uh, really refine um, best practices how we're doing. Um, thank you for that. Okay. Oh. <laughs> It's a soft box. <laughs> Great, it's like dodgeball. <laughs> now, now. Thank, and, thank you and, very and much. And then uh, we have another one here. Um, it's a fascinating presentation, Zach. Very fun, uh, but very important. And uh, to pick up from uh, David's point, I think that this area of predictive analytics is really critically important for health. Um, we don't have issues when you look at other health conditions. For example, if you look at uh, cardiovascular disease, we talk about cessation of smoking, getting into exercise. If, if when you're at risk, you've got high cholesterol levels, you can do stuff that can help avert cardiovascular events. And, and over a period of time, it has borne fruit and shown that really, that really helps. And this is a lot of promise in this field because it's trickier to grasp. But I think that if we get positive signals and then eventually maybe we can combined with some biological measures, I think that we may be at a point where we can make a tremendous difference upstream before they actually show up at the door for treatment. I think that's an excellent point and maybe a theme that we're hearing today is the value of being able to intervene at er an earlier point in time. This is, you know, uh, the depression doesn't just occur out of nowhere. Um, thank, I'll just follow up with one quick point about that, and that is that um, the internet thinks that I have heart disease because of all the talking about heart disease I did uh, around uh, in in a hospital situation around uh, around my father. And so the point is that this is being done already around non mental health issues. Um, AI is out there; they're trying to sell you know uh, heart drugs and products. So mm -hmm. why not mental health? Yeah. Um, thanks again, Zach. That was a, a really interesting talk. 
I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on issues around uh, sensitivity and specifically specificity. I mean, that's always been the problem with uh, suicide is that we have this so-called long list of risk factors, but the specificity is low. And how this might help to change that. And again, especially I'm thinking about things like in workplaces where they would get this information or the military who would gather this information and may wrongly identify people as suicide risks who are not. Right, so uh, false positives. This is, uh, of course, a big issue in mental health and a big problem in suicide research because the, the rates um, are low. So you know, just to orient everyone, if you have um, a, a, a poorly predictive test, but where there's a higher population rate of whatever that disease is, your test may perform great. Um, but with something with lower uh, rates, um, I think suicide attempts are 0.05%, um, you have this high false positive rate. So what, what do we do with them? Well, I mean, I guess the, the answers are to just keep trying to make those tests better, try to make the tests uh, perfect, maybe by combining uh, biological markers with markers like this, um, we might be able to really improve the specificity. I know that um, Bob Nicolescu and colleagues out of Indiana have attempted to do this by combining um, an app-based anxiety uh, uh, as well as other construct measurement tool with a panel of biological markers, including uh, some of the markers that we've looked at and, and generated as well. Um, and they're getting near perfect scores. So it's possible that if we get to the area of, of really trying to fill in the whole piece of the pie, the genes and environment, um, we might get there. We need to keep trying to get there. I think that you know we're going to need more research for that. But it's also important to keep in mind what these tools can do even though we're not there. And that is that if a tool is indicating that you're not at risk with a high specificity, that means you're not at risk. It, you know, If you put it into the statistical calculators, it means that one out of one people with a negative result you know, do not have suicide ideation or are not at risk of suicide attempt. So we can, we can look at the glass half empty or half full of, okay, well, it might not be perfect for identifying risk yet, but I can weed out people that might not be, and then, you know, maybe use more standard uh, methods of knowing or not knowing for whatever that uh, one in 38 people where our test uh, is currently performing, if it continues to perform that well with, uh, if it holds up with further research. Okay, a couple more questions. Maybe you can pass the box over and then behind you, sir. After. Thank you. Um, this is a more general question about your research, but probably fits in with the low base rate that Dr. Heber was referring to, and also maybe looking for converging validity. Now, I'm not tech savvy, but I'm curious if you were to use the machine capability of, let's say, looking also for converging evidence from Tumblr, let's say looking at Joyner's model, you mentioned perceived burdensomeness, thwarted sense of connectivity. The other part of the tripartite model is the acquired ability to enact lethal harm. And there was a previous speaker at a Thursday night at the Royal Conversation, a youth suicide researcher on the Do It For Darren, and uh, he spoke about Tumblr and that every, literally every minute you can see images related to suicidality. In this case, it was self-harm uh, cutters posting pictures. And I wondered if you could identify someone from Twitter and somehow link if they use Tumblr and maybe post pictures and also perhaps Facebook. Are they a member of a gun club or they, do they profess these are my interests? And then you have even more and more data that might converge and increase your specificity, for example. Thank you. That's a fantastic idea. Thank you. Uh, Mark Derrick from Ottawa Carlton Detention Center. Uh, thank you very much for the research and the information that you've shared. Uh, I can see the information can be received by so many people out in the community. However, before the doors are open for that, for that uh, pathway, I would like to suggest that there be some type of educational model uh, that people could tap into and really understand the purpose and the intent of the tools and then perhaps a certificate of approval uh, to go in and use the tool, the fear factor would be on someone that is looking so deeply for an answer 
and has access to the tool and reads it improperly and it affects it the wrong way. But if there's an educational program uh, that helps with a better understanding as to what they're looking at, why, uh, simply read, you know, not at the high level to make it easier for families that are having challenges within the family or an individual that's having challenges as an individual, if you will, that they do an educational tour and then uh, kind of ask some questions or what have you that can satisfy moving forward to a certificate with a code that they could enter the tool and it be a, a, a preventive measure. That's a fantastic idea. Thank you. Okay. I thought you were going to ask a question. <laughs> yes. One other quick question. Recognizing there's law enforcement in the room, have you thought about trying to identify homicidality and how it might combine with suicidality? Again, a great question. We have not. Uh, we haven't done that, but it's something that we could branch out, uh, potentially do. Thank you. I have both, um, I, I think it's very exciting, but also there are some concerns that we're hearing some of that on. I do think that um, there needs to be some connection to a support system in use of the application, and whether that is through an orientation or an application process, that the one of the features that heightens risk is not having a support system. And whether that's a therapist or guidance counselor or a psychologist or psychiatrist, you know, that can be determined. The other piece I, I think we sometimes think about too much is worry about the problem as opposed to have a positive spin on it and just would suggest thinking about, instead of calling it sort of the risk indicator, you know, the wellness indicator, uh, so that we are really striving for finding our wellness. And the other piece is it's, if I have an information system that says um, you're high risk for suicide and I'm not connected to the system, I'm not connected to support systems, I say, what do I do? And I'm a highly anxious person, that could actually be worse for me. So attaching us to strategies, uh, attaching us to other uh, links or button that link you to the big white wall or to bounce back or to 911 or whatever that is or here's some mindfulness exercises so really looking at um, the, the understanding that I have an issue is fine but understanding that I have a connection to a strategy or a solution is is really critical uh, and I do love the idea of this is a great tool for baselining mm -hmm. uh, in terms of interventions be able to see is this making a difference in real time Mm -hmm. um, D Dr. Kaminsky might be too humble on this one, so I'll share it anyways. When when he started working on this, he he came to community right away and started to talk about how could we apply this in the best way possible. So to your point, that's that's exactly what he's looking to. I'm speaking for him because he might be too humble to share it. But that's really the the piece that's exciting about it is who could this get into the hands of? Is it a physician and the individual has to sign off on that? You know, is it their uh, healthcare providers? Is it linked in with distress center and emergency response? So those are the things that are exciting about the application. And uh, as Zach said, I think it's still uh, in a stage right now where with community input and expert input uh, can, can grow into something that's really meaningful. So those suggestions for us in the community are excellent. So the next time Zach's asked me, I'm gonna share what you just said. So thanks for giving us that idea. This is more of a comment than a question, so bear with me here. Um, as someone who's supporting that individual who's one in five, um, that loved one of mine will share far more on social media than they will in a face-to-face -face conversation. So I appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, so when I have those check-ins with that loved one, because I don't live with them, um, I'll often take a peek at their social media. It's not Twitter before I have that check-in with them. Um, and it's, you know, the low messages, it's not Twitter that they use, but the low messages are important to me. But the moments where they are sharing something positive are more important to me. Um, it's then that I understand who their natural supports are and the help-seeking behavior. And um, so I'd be curious if there's um, 
if you can predict or use algorithms to see what help-seeking behavior they are connecting with, um, that those are really important to me as that gatekeeper, not a parent, but like as a loved one. So for those that are supporting the one in five, um, check out those happy tweets or those happy messages because that's how I can connect with them or like, how were you feeling that day? What was that positive thing that happened? Who was that support person or that app or that Netflix episode? And let's watch that together. Let's connect in that way. So, yeah. Thank you very much. We can do that and we'll do it. There's a, Thank you. There's a lady behind you who take the box. Uh, she actually just touched on something that I was thinking about in terms of social media. Um, it's well known that people tend mostly to post the highlight reels of their life. So how does that come into play with really being able to pick up on what's going on? That's a great question. Yeah. So um, I have a bit of an anecdote to answer that, but not so much uh, of a, a large statistical base to, to answer that. Um, but I was trying to get a feel for you know, what platform do we need to be in? So, of course, we picked Twitter because of the, the public nature of the data. But um, I, was, I was talking with some students, um, uh, high school students, and I said, well, what social media are you on? And they said, we're on Instagram. And I was, oh, okay, I'm not on Instagram. Except when we want to complain. Uh, then we're on Twitter. And so, um, I don't know if that's universal or not, but um, the other comment I would make is that we have to start somewhere. It's but potentially the case that you know once we vet this once we get the algorithms working they can be applied to other sorts of areas and we can grow into um, looking at photos uh, and pictures because as, as you saw from my talk um, image recognition is something that you can train the computer on you may be able to train the computer to identify pictures that that might be self-harming or even more um, subtle clues and we can ask the machines to look for whatever those patterns may be be it uh, smiles that have become less frequent or or something um, so do we have universal coverage in in other social media no uh, we don't we're just getting started and we're um, in essence, starting with the low-hanging fruit, but I think that there's room to grow. Yes, I know um, I have uh, children myself, and I know like they joke that it's old people that use Facebook, and sometimes they use uh, Instagram, but it seems to be um, Snapchat, at least for my kids and their friends and stuff. So I don't know whether that's something that you can get into as well and how that works with like I think Twitter I'm not on Twitter but it's it's all kept in history kind of like Facebook where Snapchat I believe stuff is there and then it disappears so yeah I mean I think it's it's one of those things where um, a lot of times uh, you have to start somewhere but once you start to pick up momentum it's easier to get in the door uh, so you know it could be potentially a future conversation with with snapchat snapchats once we know that things are working well uh and we can demonstrate oh things work with twitter how would you like this um and they can say yay or nay and we can potentially try to uh branch out um but i think if we if we show that we can prevent suicides that we can have a, a public health benefit then i think we'll have a strong argument for that i had uh, ian uh back there and then this other lady here. <laughs> Thank you. A great presentation, Zach. Very exciting research. And, and you kind of talked about this already, but given what you're looking at, the kind of tools you're looking at, and, and given what we know about prevalence and risk, this cries out for real active youth engagement in terms of finding out the potential of the tool, but also what's next, what's the next step once we identify, what's the pathway, what's going to make most sense to young people. We can try to guess, uh, we can measure and see whether we got it or not, or we can ask them and we can co-create solutions with them. I know you're ne sitting next to Ben and he's a champion for this, so it's, it's not a far-fetched idea. I was thrilled to hear that you were talking with students to get a sense of things. I think that that is uh, a deep dive, is, is uh, potentially very uh, worthwhile in that regard. And then looking over at uh, friends from DIFD and, and I'm thinking about the wonderful talk we had to open this session, just reminds us that uh, we're not trying to fix young people, we're trying to have young people help us find what the solutions really are. Thank you very much, Ian. Yeah, absolutely. We're, you know, we want 
everyone's input. We want to build this together with the community so that it's something that the community wants. We don't want to create a useless tool. We want to create something for everyone. So uh, we will do that. And uh, thank you very much. I think uh, there was someone in the middle, this lady over here. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I just wanted to, I was wondering, I'm not sure if you were able to do this with the privacy aspect, but you're talking about throughout this is like the computer predicting, but also it'd be great if there was a feedback mechanisms for the individuals to be seeing those those signs and symptoms, because Brianna kind of talked about that, that she was able to learn her own signs and symptoms and that helped with that. So I don't know if you ever were able to do that throughout the research. Um, yeah, not yet, but we could potentially uh, build that into future models. Yes. You're talking about linking it with other tools then that allow an individual to see what their progress is or what their progress isn't. Yeah, so they can also see, start seeing, so you're not waiting, because you're, you're talking about the computer predicting the risk, right? But mm -hmm. also the individual kind of saying, oh, these are, oh, I saw that, or I looked at that, and I was mm -hmm. able to see that these are my own signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. And if those tools, I think getting back to the point that was made earlier uh, by this gentleman, um, would allow for other online methods to be linked to it like bounce back or big white wall and so forth without a lot of effort on that individual's part yeah. that it's done for them yeah i think that's a great idea and it could also meld well with the idea of an educational tool to really understand you know what is uh what does this mean mm -hmm. uh what does it not mean um and so we can sort of uh use that and look at ourselves I, you know there's a reason why uh i guess uh if, if I get an MRI or something, I never get to see the scan, uh, <laughs> even though I want to. Uh, <laughs> although I wouldn't be able to say anything about it. So I think that uh, properly you know, saying, hey, this is what this might mean, um, and, uh, and where to go from there, I think would be very mm -hmm. useful. Thank you. We haven't heard from this side of the house yet. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I missed Hi. you. How do you envisage consent happening in this? Would the individuals have to consent? I'm trying to get into your questions about who should have access to this technology, but starting with the individual person. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that that's going to be, uh, I think that that's going to be a key factor of this, and I think that it could probably be um, either through the clinician's office or, you know, uh, potentially through some sort of password protected uh, server if it's going to be out there for people to to get a hands uh, to get you know a view of their own data potentially uh, I don't know uh, I think it's a great idea and I think that we probably should have that I don't I don't think that just having it out there for anyone to use and anybody to look at anybody is going to be the solution uh, so yeah and whoa Oops, uh, Nicole, and then there's a gentleman on the side. Thank you. Um, I guess, uh, Dr. Kaminsky, just maybe to expand on the potential applications from community, because one of the things when we looked at your presentation was the potential to help people on the wait list, and particularly if there's consent, but also I think the role for gatekeepers. So if you can comment in terms of potentially, if you have that information, how do gatekeepers who are all here uh, today, how can they use that collaboratively? Right. I mean, um, that's really the question, is, is how best to use this. Um, and I invite the gatekeepers to think about it and also to get in touch with me and let me know how you would want it to be used. Um, I believe there's also potentially going to be comment sheets as well. So if you don't get a chance to talk uh, today using the microphone now, but would like to give me your two cents, uh, I'd love to hear opinions uh, on how you would want to see this used, how you would want to um, potentially interact with uh, clients of yours, um, or, or what you think your client's interest would be if you are a client, how, whether you would want this or not. Uh, I encourage you to uh, give us all of your feedback. Um, our job is to build the tool. Um, but we really want to understand how best to use it. I think that that's clear from what we've been saying. So I don't have all the answers yet to you know what we envision gatekeepers being able to do with it versus not, um, because that's going to be in a discussion with everyone. Dear 
Uh, just two quick things. One is on, on access. And just wondering, and I, I think having it just go, and I was sort of supporting having it always connected to a clinician or, or a support person, but that leaves out a lot of people who don't have that. And just wondering if there's a possibility of two levels, like Safe Talk versus Assist. They have a basic model that is much more public, and then sort of that deeper dive model that is more therapeutic and connected to somebody. The other thing that, that's becoming a growing concern on uh, potential abuse uh, are borders. Uh, and so there have been cases where uh, police have been involved in a, um, a suicide call and at the U.S. has then prevented that person from going into uh, the states. That right now all cell phone information coming back from the states, Canada is dumping, pulling that information off your cell phones and computers and they have it all. Uh, so that's a big worry in terms of the privacy piece and how much uh, information that we are voluntarily putting into or using on our applications like phones uh, may be pulled out and used in things in ways that we weren't uh, having it attended. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a huge concern in terms of information sitting uh, on people's devices. Yeah, thank you. Those are really great points. I think the uh, the other takeaway message that I'm uh, getting from your comment is uh, to have a stepped care model from the very beginning so that people can be slotted in or matched with their needs from the onset. So um, not as high a need, uh, next level, next level after that, et cetera. I'm just gonna make a quick comment here. Speaking from a law enforcement perspective, we're constantly trying to gauge members who are going through traumatic events and to see how they are faring after the event, right? So this is a key piece of research that you've done that potentially could help us in an early intervention sort of model, right? We are struggling at the at this point to figure out, you know, how, what, how is it that somebody is fine after a bus train collision and how is somebody totally not able to even function in their personal professional life anymore. So, and then just grabbing that person and finding out, well, who is it amongst the platoon of 30 people that experienced the exact same trauma? You know, who is it that is struggling? We Sometimes we don't know that, right? Because your game face is the, at work is the last to drop as we kind of all know. So I think it's, it's very interesting. I do have some concerns around, um, well, speak, now I work in HR, which I never thought I would, but it's like, how do we, how do we police this in the sense that how do we make sure that we don't use it for you know the the abuse right so you know all potential recruits coming to an organization we now search you on this uh, and then we're like well this is a liability for an organization now because you have an increased su suicidal ideation which i could see as a, a real you know that's the other side of the, the coin where i think a lot of people did comment on it but i th i think that once you i mean you're aware of it we're all aware of it in the room the the stakeholders are all aware i think that is key that you know that's moving forward when we do build in consent models and and you know the confidentiality piece that we use this to say okay we can't use this to exclude people we're, we're using this to actually help more people right which mm -hmm. i think is good and to help destigmatize that's right individuals yes I'm not gonna throw it. thank you uh, this is related to a previous question that was asked. I'm just thinking about marginalized communities specifically and individuals from those communities who are suffering from mental health difficulties and sometimes whose symptoms are more associated with vulnerabilities to criminality than the general population uh, and the fears that are associated of surveillance uh, within those communities of surveillance and policing and maybe some of the potential consequences of that. Uh, I'm just thinking also about the implications of having the policing community have access to this information in, in regards to these marginalized communities and individuals. And I'm thinking, I guess my question is, have you thought about what that could look like? Have you had any uh, communication with these communities and maybe some of the thoughts that they have in relation to this? I've started thinking about it right now. Uh, <laughs> um, no, so we haven't, we haven't looked at that or done any work in that regard. but. Um, I meant what I started with, you know, we're going to, you know, that's a great point and we'll certainly uh, consider that and think about that as, as we move forward. Yes, another question down here. Uh, 
not a question, but a comment on it. with the ACE study and ACE in five and the high correlation to suicide up to 80% for certain age groups, uh, that early childhood adversity, I'm sure you're looking at that piece in terms of building in in the background somewhere. And just wondering if uh, that's if you could talk a little bit more about that and and your thoughts about how you connect some of those early child experiences that again highly predictive into um, you know ten years fifteen years in with adults many years later. Yeah. So how do we connect those adverse childhood experiences, uh, those traumatic influences that we know uh, can really increase risk? And I think that the answer there, um, it's not going to be in something that you're tweeting today or tomorrow or, or last month, um, but it might be uh, there might be a record of that in your DNA. That relates to the epigenetic piece, mm. the biology. We know that ACEs um, are associated with epigenetic changes in stress hormone genes, um, like the glucocorticoid receptor, um, like SCA2, uh, we see interactions with um, uh, early life trauma scores based on the child trauma questionnaire with uh, our predictive accuracy um, in these genes. So the, the overarching message is that while we might not get that in real time, this relates, it, it circles back to the stress diathesis model. Uh, biological vulnerability, which maybe have been put there by an early life trauma meets a stressor. So this part gets the stressor and potentially the biology, the biological test part could give us a feel for who's vulnerable. We haven't been able to link data between uh, social media and biology, but we do have some uh, funding uh, applications out there to try to do that to understand, you know, does our specificity improve if we link the two? Um, are we getting more of uh, more of the puzzle? But I think the answer is going to be um, in in what molecular record those uh, experiences have left that we can measure. We still have five minutes. I have a question. Timing. Uh, where would you like to be in two years' time? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think um, I always, uh, I've been asked these questions before with biological markers, and I always uh, guess too quickly. I'd love to see um, a beta version of apps in clinical trials somewhere uh, being used to see if they, uh, or potentially have prevention data. Um, I think one of the interesting things about the, a technology like this compared to a biological test is um, we don't have all of those sort of uh, Health Canada or FDA sort of uh, uh, levels to necessarily go through to vet. So we could potentially generate something much quicker. Um, you know, it's available, it works now. I think once we really think about all of the issues we're talking about today and how to potentially uh, uh, bring it out there safely to create good and not harm, as well as do some really good scientific vetting, um, make sure that things are working really as well as we think they are. Again, I've got a message of hope here today. Our model seems to work fantastically, and we've done our absolute best to be really rigorous, but we're never satisfied. We wanna make sure that this is really going to be something that works, um, because that's gonna be uh, a part of, of doing good and, and not creating harm is that, um, uh, that it really works the way we think we are. So then, um, you know, in two years' time, I'd love to see it out there in some people's hands, and I'd love to to be evaluating uh, what the effects are, either, you know, on a population uh, level in studies or just for individuals. That's what I'd like to be, mm. where I'd like to be. Any other questions? Maybe one last one from me, then. What do you need to get there? Okay, uh, well that's that's a good question. What we need, um, as I mentioned, we need to, to get access to uh, samples and uh, social media data information from uh, the same individuals. And so uh, we need funding for that and we're uh, seeking that funding uh, together, um, working with uh, uh, Jennifer Phillips here uh, to um, to do that, uh, as well as uh, Katerina uh, uh, Nikolovic here at the hospital to try to uh, do those sorts of studies. We need more data, too. Uh, so we need to uh, try to get uh, larger 
cohorts of data because machine learning, the robustness of these models is really, um, they become better the more data you have. Uh, and so we would really want to get more data um, and be in talks with uh, uh, people like at Twitter to try to understand uh, or to try to build our data to make our models uh, really as strong as they can possibly be. Wonderful. Okay, a comment over here, and then we'll wrap it up. Hi, thank you, Zach. That was fabulous. I just have a comment. Maybe I'm just being hopeful. Um, I think a big piece is from what I'm hearing is that we're still afraid of what the test result will be. If it's a positive from the data, well, what are people going to think of me because I test, tested positive? And I think that's part of the fear and stigma still related with suicide. As a nurse, I think to if I go to get a blood test and I'm pre-diabetic, I'm grateful that I was identified so that I can treat my diabetes and take those next steps. And I'm also grateful that I'm not. So either way, I'm grateful for the result. Mm -hmm. Or I can take it a step further. And if I went to test for an STD, I'm a little bit more leery to let someone know that I was being tested, but I'm grateful for the positive result because I can seek treatment. And I'm also grateful, okay, I don't have it. So I think it's still cr part of the fear is, what we're going to do with the test result. And that's the stigma that we have to continue to work through. Mm -hmm. And who owns that test result. Right. Mm -hmm. But see it as a grateful either if it's a positive or a negative, because you can uh, take the necessary next steps. If I'm diabetic, I'm getting uh, a nutritionist, whatever that next step would be. And if I'm not, then I don't have to take them. But I'm grateful for either, Dr. either results. Doctor Burke. I think that's all the more reason why anti-stigma campaigns have to go hand in glove with research, with what we're trying to provide in terms of mental health and substance treatments. I'd like to um, now invite um, uh, someone to come and close off our thanks to Dr. Kaminsky. Our community has been inspired by the Richardson family and the stories of others who galvanized attention on suicide prevention. Their openness in sharing their family story has enabled many important conversations about suicide and inspired community giving for youth initiatives that helped change the conversation and encourage people to seek help. I would now like to invite Stephanie Richardson, mother, advocate, and co-founder of DIFD, to say a few words and to thank Dr. Kaminsky. Um, days like today can be uh, a little more challenging for people who have actually been um, on the unhopeful side of it, when we're the aftermath of what has gone wrong and, and we are missing someone so dearly. But for me, the hopeful part is seeing everybody here and what our community has done. Um, we've lived a lot of different places. I think we are the leaders in this in Ottawa, and I see that by us working together. This would not happen without all of you agreeing to work together, and we've all had to do that, and, and we've not had uh, role models and leaders for this. No other community does it like this, and we've gone from being anti-stigma to research and to see it go hand in hand. I believe we are doing that, and we're going to continue to do that, and that's how we're going to save lives. So thank you very much, Dr. Kaminsky. Not only have you taken on the role of our chair, but you've taken on our community and you care what they think, how they feel. And I've seen it firsthand that when he was hired here, um, he's so passionate about the biology side of it. And it has to be that way. But representing a million dollars from the youth that was raised through the youth and raised through you guys, it was dollar to dollar. It wasn't hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was dollars. It was quarters. and. By coming together, we were able to donate a million dollars to Dr. Kaminsky. And when I asked about the youth and what he was going to do to give back to the community in regards to the youth, he said he had an idea. And in a very short period of time, he's gone from A to this. And it's incredible what you've done and how serious you took that. So I want to say thank you, a very genuine thank you. And we're blessed to have you here.